Welcome to a special episode of SolarWinds Lab, where we're going to cover a bunch of the new features, the latest release for the SolarWinds Orion platform. We've got a ton to get to, and um, one of the greatest things here is because of the interwebs and hopefully a little bit of upstream bandwidth, we're going to be able to include more product managers and more product specialists than we've ever had in an episode before. And so to start, please welcome Orion Platform Product Manager, Jeff Blank. Hey, Patrick. How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty well. If you can tell, I'm just a little bit excited about this. We've got over a dozen features to go over. So why don't we just jump straight in and let's talk about the new modern dashboards because, I mean, look at this, right? So well, not just column Patrick, spanning, we can Patrick, edit these. Time out, time out, time out. <laughs> bring it back a little bit. We've got a lot to cover, a lot of great enhancements. The platform in general has tons of stuff to cover, and we have a little bit of time. Let's go through it in a little bit of more of a progression before we jump right okay. in. Okay, all right, that's fair, that's right. And we're gonna be talking about over a dozen new features that have been added across, not just the network monitoring and management tools, systems, databases, and security. So we are going to get into these in depth in this episode. Um, but uh, why don't we start actually with maybe the thing that, it, it seems subtle, but for existing customers, especially ones with really complex environments, is the new installer. And when I ran this thing, I mean, I got to see it, you know, for months early and play with it. Um, but the first time I did my upgrade, I was really surprised at how smooth that experience was. Yeah, you know, Patrick, that's a, that's a great place, right? Because where do we start all these features enhancements other than how do we get there first, right? And first, our customers really need to upgrade and have that experience. And we did a lot of work around this piece to make sure that that is a more pleasurable experience and give back customers that critical thing that none of us have enough of, which is time, right? Um, so the first piece, um, you know, that I'd like to bring up is, is we're bringing back an old friend, right? In the 2020.2 release, um, that we're talking about here, right? We're bringing back support for Windows 2012 and SQL 2012 database, right? We still have a large uh, portion of our customers uh, running 2012, and this really just removes a blocker to make sure they get to take advantage of this great, great release. All right, the, the next thing that we did, um, you know, which, which seems small, uh, but like you said, you experienced it. I know you're tinkering in your lab, right? Uh, was improvements in the configuration wizard, right? Really, that's all about optimizing the behind the scenes functionality to ensure we're expediting, again, the time it takes to complete that task. Um, I don't wanna get too big into the technical weeds, but we did a whole lot of things to optimize that performance. Um, one of those we call in-house configuration wizard parallelization, right? right. Um, that's really about multitasking, right? Mm -hmm. I know you cook a lot, you talk about it, but you probably don't start that venture by going to the grocery store, picking up one ingredient at a time, coming back to the house, going back to the grocery store, right? So in essence, that's kind of what we did here. We made sure that we were taking advantage of the resources uh, that are sitting idle uh, when they're not supposed to be, right? Um, right. So it's shown massive, massive amounts of improvements. I know in, in one example of my lab from you know, a previous run of 20 minutes down to five minutes. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's quite a drastic change. Well, and because the because you're essentially running that same code, even with the uh, new remote install um, capability, that code runs on your uh, remote pollers as well. Um, so b you're seeing not only benefits just to that initial install, but especially if you have remote pollers, that is a multiplicative gain in time uh, or reduction of time in the <laughs> overall end-to-end -end deployment uh, for an update. Exactly right. Exactly right. And and we didn't start there. And you already made the, the point to bring this up. We wanted to combine those improvements, those types of things with something else. In this case, we want to pay special attention to our customers that have those more complex environments, right? You just mentioned polling engines and any scalability engine, whether it's additional web servers, HA, right? Those running all those different types of scalability engines and those larger distributed environments, you know, they end up with a larger task when it's time to upgrade. Um, and we needed to do something about that. So using the power of centralized upgrades, we introduced a new workflow and a special a special feature that I really want to highlight here because I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think less talking, just show it because it is so straightforward to use now. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Okay, Patrick. So this is kind of where 
we start out here. And if you're unfamiliar with centralized upgrades, it was delivered a release back or so and, and really allowing customers to take advantage uh, of this new My Orion deployment page where you can see deployment health and some other things. Uh, but I wanted in particular to talk about kind of the new UI and workflow uh, that we're looking at here on the screen, right? In this case, uh, the updates and evaluations tab is, is representing what I have running in my environment and what I have the option to upgrade to if I so desire. Now, many customers didn't realize that in the past they could use this tool to kind of identify what they need to do to ready themselves for the, the upgrade. Um, we didn't have a clear decision-making tree and they really were hesitant to, to start an upgrade no joke, I, I did that a few times myself, so I can understand why they ran into that piece. Right? Well, it's but, also nice because you know what you have. So a lot of times you'll see us talking about new features, and you're like, well, what version do I have? Or maybe even if there's a module that's gotten you know, kind of out of phase, um, you can come to this page and you'll know exactly what you're currently running. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and you can see that here in this example. And what I have and what I want to focus on is kind of the three options down here at the bottom, right? We have a make a plan, pre-stage, or upgrade and eval now, right? If you're a customer ready to go, you're already uh, full steam ahead. You have that third option. You know what that does. It walks you through the normal process. And all of these follow the same type of workflow. But if I choose make a plan, for example, what this does is bring up the next page, which gives me even more detail about what I have available, the products that I have installed in this particular lab, what they will be upgraded to. I can even choose to install additional product evaluations, learn more about products I may not be aware about. Right, it, it just gives us opportunity to to do that, um, you know, right here from a single screen. And, well, and one of the things that I love most about this view too is the release notes button right there is going to take you directly to the release notes for that module for that release. So, I mean, you can go out to the customer success center, and I, you can. It's pretty easy to navigate, but here there's there's none of that. You literally click on the release notes tab, and you can see what those features are. If there's been like scalability improvements or maybe uh, requirements or recommendations, that's going to the details of of if you are interested in the details. If you're not not just say one, two, three, install. That's a great way to read the, read those notes if you want to. Hundred percent agree, and I think it's a great point too. Um, once we continue, and if I choose the next button down at the bottom of the screen, what we'll automatically do, and I have a smaller environment in this example, but we'll make sure that we can connect to each of those scalability engines. You can see I have an HA server here. There was an additional polling engine. And if there is a problem, what it does is tell me, hey, we were unable to connect to that for some reason. That might be something you were unaware of, something you can go troubleshoot. You can choose to exclude servers, all those types of things. Um, but it gives us the ability to um, make sure, one, you have access to all the things that you need access to. Well, it's great because if you maybe have a lab puller or something else that maybe you've sort of forgotten about, that normally you'd go through your upgrade process and the upgrade might stall right there. You can make sure that that's not going to happen because your connectivity to all of those is available before you ever start. Exactly right. The next page here is, of course, the systems checks. Many customers might be familiar with this. This is really our health checks, making sure things are okay, right? On that polling engine, do you have enough disk space? Um, you know, is there some sort of other update that you need to be aware of? We do have indications that tell you, hey, something to check out before you proceed, um, you know, and of course do database backups and all those types of things. So this is a handy page to make sure you do take the time to read through. This will make sure your upgrade goes smoothly. Yeah, one of the things that was a surprise to me was I, I saw a whole bunch of updates are required, right? And we were talking about Windows updates were required. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, I was thinking, oh, I, I just don't want to have to go do those. I don't want to do this platform updates. But on the other hand, we don't live in a world anymore where uptime for years is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so it is a reminder that there are a lot of times just pl OS platform updates, or maybe there's some other software running on that server or that, that, that uh, workstation that really ought to get upgraded. So yeah, sometimes you're like, okay, I am going to go have to go and bounce that machine, <laughs> but I probably should have done it anyway for security fixes yep. or something else. So it'll tell you that ahead of time so that if you have like pending updates or restart required that were already sitting on that machine, um, I mean, we're not going to require a restart, but uh, they're already sitting on that machine. You can take care of that first. So again, that's going to prevent something where there's a, a OS level blocker to the Orion upgrade. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And this is really where I have... Uh, you can see there at the bottom, 
options, right? We chose that make a plan to start with. And now I have the ability to do a number of things. I can print this out, right? For those of us that have strict change controls, if I need documentation or something like that, I have the ability to actually print this out and go run and take care of all these tasks, right? I have 30 polling engines with low disk space or something like that. I can go take care of all those tasks, come back and run these checks again and, and, and be fine to go, right? Or I have the option to proceed with what we really want to talk about that start downloading files. This is the option to pre-stage your environment. And what this is about is, is many customers during their upgrades, they, they have to schedule, you know, we won't lie about it, maybe days, maybe weekends, maybe a little bit longer, right, to accomplish these upgrades in these very complex environments, right? You've heard that right. before, haven't you? If, if, you've got, if you've got 30 or more remote pollers, it, it's, it, it, there's just download time to get the bits onto those machines, yeah. Exactly right. And customers in the past, what they used to do is take the, the, the installers and move them to the servers and, uh, you know, kind of do all that work themselves, but that still takes time. And why not take that out of the customer's hand and make it easy for them and, uh, you know, Basically, we're going to do it automatically through the web console and through centralized. Well, that's a great point because this is something that um, you all had worked on in the last couple of releases. And there were there's a great thread, a couple of them out on Thwack that actually explained how to do that deployment manually. And the feedback from customers was, this is fantastic. This has cut a third or more out of the overall end-to-end -end deployment after clicking uh, update. So essentially what you did here was took the uh, that best practice and automated it for everyone, right? Exactly so that's, again, right. one of those things, it's a process that came out of THWAC and working with the PM team, and now it's literally just under that button. Exactly right, exactly right. So when we click that button, um, you know, the same process uh, ensues, uh, but what you'll see here is, hey, it's it's gone through, we're, we're pre-staging files, and this can be done, again, before that maintenance window, before you've scheduled that downtime, right, just to get the bits where they need to go, right? So you can see in this case, I excluded uh, a particular server, and you have the option to do that and come back later and update that, um, but it's going to run through, um, do its downloading, tell you the progress. It's always going to start with the main polling engine. And then what it'll do is sequentially run uh, five in, in groups of five, uh, all the rest of your scalability engines and get those bits where they need to go. And once again, those downloads are coming from the main Orion server itself. It's not going back out on the internet every time. So you can make sure the bits are the right version. And once that's complete, it's pretty easy. You see download complete. You can move on with your day, go back, come back a week later, a month later, whatever you prefer. You know, and the beauty here is there is some intelligence built in as well. If you come back, let's say, you know, a month from now and all of a sudden we've released something new, right? The 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 next release is available and next updates, it will tell you and say, hey, you have the option to either proceed with your upgrade or go through the process again, get the right bits, and we'll even make sure, hey, we take the bits that existed and we just go grab the bits that we don't have, you know, in so facto, and then right. allow you to perform the upgrade, right? Now, this real quick, I just wanted to highlight a couple screenshots because we do have those advanced users out there, and many times they are those customers that are using these more complex environments, and we do have the ability to script this through the Orion SDK. Yeah, I know, you're getting excited, exactly. Um, you know, so that is available for you. You can walk through the same steps, the process. You can even specify whether or not you want to do the upgrades of your um, current running environment. You can specify, hey, you just want to install evaluations, specify the script argument, it's all documented and out there. And so you're showing this over here on the right-hand side, that's uh, Swickle Studio. So again, that's showing you what's gonna be executed or creating the example scripts that you can cut and paste into the uh, platform of your choice. Exactly right. Okay, I'm not saying I could get lost in APIs all day, but let's let's go back and talk about the new modern dashboards because this is something that has saved me a bunch of time creating new dashboards. I think the point is, one, you get new advanced widgets that weren't available before, but two, I like to really do differentiated dashboards for different groups, especially like build something for a manager, for example, and like get them to spend their time looking at that instead of looking at the big dashboard. So I get a lot more reuse in addition to functionality I didn't get before. Yeah, I know, Patrick. You've been patiently waiting, and 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 it's it's here, so we can we can talk about it, right? Yeah, what you see up on the screen is is a great view of that. It's just an example, right? The my colleague Tony Johnson is another platform PM, um, and and him and the dev team have have done this first version of what we refer to as modern dashboards, right? These data-driven dashboards were developed to provide that 
that even greater level of flexibility. Of course, there's a lot of widgets that people have always wanted in there. You know, one of my favorites is the donut chart, so don't even get me started. But, but this was built with performance in mind. Um, using a grid-based layout system so we can have that vertical and horizontal scaling however we want, um, you know, and and this is really, you know, it is a lot of fun to play with, right? Okay, but bef um, even before you do that, this is updating in real time, right? These widgets it, are updating in real time, and we call these it, widgets now, not resources, right? Yes, correct. We, we really do refer to them as widgets, and, and what you're seeing here is an example lab, but what you don't even realize is this is actually an EOC, too. So this is actually working in the enterprise operations console in my example here. Tony had a couple other labs I could choose from. Uh, but in general, I know you guys plan to maybe have a, a bigger lab episode just on this topic at a later date. Um, but we did want to chat about it because it's really important. It's got a lot of uh, comments and great feedback on Thwack already. Um, you know, again, you have complete control to, you know, edit the dashboard. Um, you know, I can drag more widgets. I can change that size out. If I can grab a corner here, um, I could change that size of that widget, um, you know, uh, adjust how things are laid out. Um, you know, it's pretty neat. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to edit the widget, we have all sorts of ways to, to choose whether that's a chart option like a pie or we want the legend below or we want to customize the data model. And, and this is, you know, a little bit more advanced. There's a graphical query builder, a hand edit SQL option. You know, there's lots of ways in which you can format this stuff. It's super, super flexible and really responsive. You can see examples where I even did things like, you know, simple table widgets, um, you know, the KPI or what people refer to as the big number widget, right? These are always helpful, exactly like you were talking about. Executives love to see this stuff. Give me big, just clear, concise data information on a screen. Let me know what's going on. Um, these are always super helpful. Of course, our time series widgets, um, you know, even vertical and horizontal um, options uh, to, to scroll whether we want, uh, you know, uh, bar charts and, and different tables. And, and you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty um, great to, to be able to see this and where we're heading um, with a new modern UI. Well, and scroll back down there to the bottom um, because, you know, these are available in knock views as well, right? So if you wanted, for example, you know, the good old network device detail view that we've, you know, relied, all relied on for years, it is available too. So if you want to combine traditional resources, or in this case, I would use a dynamic group that would then be a filter on that list. So if I had a particular set of resources that I wanted to make sure were, you know, present in my top of my knock view, along with these summary views or the big number uh, widgets, it really lets you customize that in a way that really I don't think was possible before. Agreed, 100%. It's it's really cool. I can't wait to see what happens next. You know, if anybody's interested and and want to get involved in the conversation, you know, make sure to reach out to us via Thwack and stuff. Tony's got a great post out there where he walks through some examples in detail, and I'm sure you guys are going to talk about this more at a later time. Yeah, that is one thing about this release, and definitely both check out the release notes, uh, look at the six customer success center, but there's also the Thwack post that we'll link here that actually have those step-by-step -step with screenshots, and a lot of them are animated GIFs so that you can kind of see how they work visually. Definitely go check those out. I mean, if we did we're going to be doing drill downs into this for eons, probably <laughs> on lab. But yeah, uh, definitely check those out because the level of detail there and follow along examples are great. Okay, so next we got to talk about maps. We keep talking about maps, maps 2.0, and it's so funny because our, our new Orion maps, um, but they have grown so much over the last couple of releases, and this one really does feel different. Like there's there, some of the things that you've been able to do with iconography and color and background and the rest of it really let you customize these in a way that I don't even think the old maps would have let you do. So let's talk about those. Yeah, let's do it. This is definitely a little bit of, a, as, as you would say, a passion project of mine. And there's been a lot going on here, um, you know, and, and, you know, I know we even tease a little bit at times. Um, I might be able to show you how to travel back in time here in just a second. I have tons to cover here, and I really want to take the time to go through it. Yeah, so you're starting here on a view. This is the map editor, and if you were upgraded to the latest previous release, which was in 2019.4, you'd see a view that looks like this. So what you're going to do is walk us through how it's changed and so the new capabilities built on top of this. 
Right. I think the best way, right? Like I was going to make a joke and say I had this PowerPoint presentation, right? But I know you would come with pitchforks and everything like that. And and this is really all about being visual, right? The Orion Max project is about taking the wealth of data in Orion, those relationships and all those metrics and stats giving it structure, right? Data is just boring by itself. Giving it context, turning it into more actionable information, right? So this is exactly where we're going to begin. This is what you might see if you, like you said, were 2019.4 and you could accomplish this. Now, it looks a little bit different and I'll go through some of those nuances here. And one of the things that I noticed right away is there's a connection that I expect to see and I want to do that, right? This was available in the last release and I think you and I have both talked about how much we like this feature. So I'm going to walk through how to make a manual connection when automated topology just didn't happen to do it. Or there is no way that topology could have done that, especially for a composite application where you are the only one who knows how those packets are traveling. Exactly. And, and that's a perfect example because I'm technically not even monitoring any interfaces on this particular node. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a topology connection because this is how my infrastructure is set up. And what you'll see here in, our, in the new map editor, right, in the 2020.2 release is a little bit different view of the toolbar. There were a couple control actions before that kind of popped in, popped out. We made sure they were visible so you knew they were uh, uh, available to you. And of course, based on selections, things activate, right? So I'm going to click connect object here. And over here on my, my switch, I know exactly what um, yeah. port I want to connect to, um, right? I'm going to connect um, actually on this uh, FA011 here, apply. And then over on the Hyper-V server, when I click configure here, you'll see that it actually pulls up and, and tells me I don't have any information. It's because I'm not monitoring any interfaces. Now, I could go correct that, monitor the interface if I want. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, is kind of trick it. And this might be um, important for those users when they have devices uh, that they only have an interface on one side, right? right. Um, you know, out to the cloud or something like that, Patrick. So I can kind of trick this. So I'm going to choose the same device on the other side and the interface there, and I'm going to click apply. Now, the little toggle here allows me to say show ingress, and that's really so this topology connection that you can see examples of in the background don't show the same metrics visibly on the screen and, and what I'm trying to get after. Now. I'm also not going to do this for this particular use case, but I wanted to bring up these two bullets because this is very important. For this map only, obviously, exactly as it seems, right? It's for this map only. This second piece is something that you and I get really excited about, right? It's for all Orion. Mm -hmm. right? And what that well, means is when I create that connection, and go, go ahead, Patrick. You were well, well, no, I was going to say, I, I have found this to be really useful because I end up building a lot of maps for other folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so if it's something where I want to establish that connection, it is always, in this case, maybe between those two physical interfaces, it is always going to be the same. And then any other map or a perf stack view or an app stack view or something else that could actually inherit that connection, everybody's going to see that. But if it's something where it's an application that's different, maybe it's an application for focus map or it's a network focus map or there's VPN traffic or out to cloud where the logical topology of that map is different in terms of the services that that map represents, that lets you have both the sort of default connection plus specific connections by, you know, map by map. Exactly, exactly. And, and you're right. When I choose this for all of Orion, it shows up in the NPM topology widget right along the rest of the topology uh, connections that were discovered too. So, you know, it makes sense for a user. And that way, like you said, if I go build another map or somebody's looking in the contextual maps that are in the static subviews on a no details page, that connection shows up, right? So it's a real cool way to allow you to use a, a design tool and a mapping tool to define topology in the product, right? So we'll click create here and then we'll move on to some of the other things. So Patrick, yeah, what we have here on the right hand side are, are what we refer to as the property panels. Now the map has a property panel itself. Every entity on the canvas will have a property panel and these allow us to do those custom enhancements that we want. It's about making this map make sense for my organization and my team um, and what makes the most sense for us, um, right? I have the option to do uh, backgrounds now and this is really so if I choose a background image 
or I can choose a background color. The background image, in, in this case, if I chose that, would pop up on the back, and it wouldn't be selectable when I do like my lasso or something like that, so it doesn't drag it all over the screen and those types of things. For those users that we're aware of, that we can insert images as well, right? So there's a, there's a difference there, and it just makes it uh, a little bit more simple. In this case, I'm just gonna choose a color. Um, you know, I'm a little partial to blue. I always end up doing that. That's what we're going with, Patrick, so hopefully that works for you. <laughs> So the, the next thing here, this is, you know, uh, again, we have the toolbar here and, and I want to highlight certain things, right? Like there's unique features, undo, redo, that, that's nowhere else in Orion. And that's really more in a drawing tool. And, and those are the things that we're trying to blend here, that, that Visio-esque type drawing with the monitoring solution. So you do not have to leave this tool. Um, you know, there's ability to select all um, from entities to shapes, right? We can insert shapes. Um, you actually have options to do alignment. So if we add shapes and those types of things, this is that bring forward front to back type control again, to where it's just easy, simple to construct and customize this map. First, let's start with just scaling, right? So if you could see here, I kind of have these named fairly decently, right, DC. So this is obviously some of my domain controllers doing ADM connections, right, from right. application dependency the, connections. The importance of these objects is not the same. They are not equal and it is not flat. 100%, 100%. So, so I want these to stand out a little bit more. And of course, I have the infrastructure that is impacted or could impact these and their performance, as well as that network infrastructure. And you can see the map updating on, on certain things going on in the environment. But I'm actually going to select these guys here. And I just want to take a look at what I have to do in the properties panel. And we'll start with size and position, right? So you could see lots of different options here. And I'm actually going to make these um, quite a bit bigger. So I can type in, we can get pixel perfect. It enlarges those items. There's a couple other things that I want to make a little bit bigger. Again, everything can be done in bulk. So you can see when I select one object, it tells me what that is. If I hold the control keys like you're used to in Visio or whatnot, I can make these items bigger. Um, you know, I also have uh, the, the lasso object here um, where I can select these guys. Um, and, and then, of course, it shows me three objects. And I'm going to make these just slightly bigger, too. Um, you know, again, if we're dealing with images or I'm inserting shapes and squares, which we may, we may get to in this example, I have options to toggle the aspect ratio so I can change those shapes. Um, you can even, you know, find out exactly what the X and Y coordinate is because there's been times where I feel like it's lined up, but something seems quite off. I can get it pixel perfect, right, Patrick? Yeah, and I just love that because you can use size as a, a, a visual indication of relative importance or how much time you should spend observing that. Because in this case, there is um, a little bit of this packet loss on um, uh, that bottom transit link. And if that icon is large, then maybe I ought to start there first troubleshooting. If it's if it's if I'm going into a warning state in and out, but I'm not seeing any other application issues, well, maybe we'll get to that later. But like that idea of being able to come for someone on the team who maybe has never seen a map before, spent time on it, they get an incident report. They're trying to do troubleshooting. The first thing when you come to a map is being able to visually represent where to start troubleshooting saves a ton of time. Yeah, exactly right. Now, you know, if if this were it, maybe it'd be a little bit cooler. But we're not going to stop there, right? There's something that's really bugging me and customers because we listened there was a lot of things that customers really wanted and we really got a lot of that in this release right and one of those things is text right i have some of these labels and places and things where i i don't really want them you know it kind of obscures like you were saying the view of the map and some of these items so what's unique is i can select a, a number of objects i can select this text property piece. Now, the first thing that I want to start with is this actual position, and this is the text anchoring. So here in this case, I might want to say, hey, move everything up top center, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I see this guy here, it's kind of combined with a, a ton of things, right? I'm going to say, you know, let's go top left, right? Um, for these guys, you know, let's go uh, middle right, you know, um, some of our other guys were okay. These guys are just slightly off, so I can even mm -hmm. just use a little bit of an alignment piece, a um, little trick, and kind of move that out. And if I stop there, look how much better the map looks just from that piece. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of drastic. I can do a select all here. Of course, I can use uh, select all entities, so it'll select everything, go back to text. And one thing that I want to change against that blue background, I'm going to change this to white, right? Mm -hmm. 
And now look at how we're starting to change these. And of course, I can make it bold. I can change the font size. I can change the, the little fonts. And no, Patrick, I'm not going to do Comic Sans for you. I know you like that one. <laughs> I love just for irony that you did include Comic Sans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. we got to have a little bit of fun around here, right? Another important piece, too, is that in old Network Atlas, right? We're, we're not going to lie here. The, the eventual goal here is to deprecate Network Atlas. That announcement was made. It does not mean that Network Atlas is going away tomorrow in the next release, um, but in the future, it will probably say sayonara, right? Um, in the meantime, we wanted to make sure we're doing some of those things as customers requested that allow us to parity Network Atlas. Um, and in that case, I'm going to select um, these guys. I'm actually going to select my network gear. Um, these are important pieces. And I'm going to go back into text. And I want to talk about this piece. This is where we can add in whatever we want. I can type in values and those types of things. But I can also click plus, And when I select mul multiple objects, this will be an intersection of all those objects and those entity types and all the properties associated to them. Um, so I'm going to choose, you know what? I don't want uh, IP address. Let's go machine type. And I'm going to add that in. Insert the selected and make sure that it gets put where I wanted it, right? And now all those have a machine type. We got to keep in mind that some of these maps might be in places where users are not going to be interacting with them, right? Mm -hmm. On a knock dashboard, like you mentioned before, um, and I might need more information. Now, another and if, cool a, if the value is blank, it just doesn't, doesn't uh, present it. So you also don't have to worry about laying out for blank spaces. It'll take care of that for you. Exactly. An another cool piece with this is I'm going to go back in here and I'm actually going to just grab this, this first thing. You can see there are some metrics in here, but a little pro tip, a little behind the scenes thing. If I hold shift when I click insert selected properties, what this does is actually add a prefix and a suffix based on the units and things that I added. So now I have my average response time, three milliseconds, completely showing for each of these devices. And I've got a really cool map so far um, for that piece. To our next topic, right? This is, this is one of those things that everybody loves because the first question when 2019.4 came out was, can I do custom icons, right? You, have you heard that before at all? <laughs> Just a couple of times. That, <laughs> yeah. that was slightly upvoted in Flack. <laughs> yeah, maybe just a little bit, right? I have tons of, of, of flexibility and options here. And, and let's just take this group of domain controllers first. I'm going to expand this. And you can see it's got a default icon. Um, I can actually click down. And we provide some for you. Um, you know, maybe uh, by chance I, I like this icon better, right? Um, now, you know, you have options. What you have is ability to do shapes. So if I wanted a rectangle around this object or even a hexagon, you know, that's what I'm using for status um, is these status rings. I can change color of those. I can use a status badge if I'd like, um, you know, and one, I want to make these a little bit bigger, um, but let's go ahead and do that for all my entities again. So I'm going to select that, go back into icon and say, hey, take up more of that space there. And we'll say 65 might be a good number, right? So again, it kind of takes up the available space and gives me a little bit better picture, kind of brings that in, um, you know, uh, again, lots of flexibility. Um, as I mentioned, if you wanted to browse and use your own icon, you can see I've actually done some here uh, that'll let me do things with those service maps. And you see something here I want to bring up real quick. Um, there is some really cool ways in which we could say, hey, you know what? If I wanted to have a different type of map, right? Maybe these icons aren't really what I'm after. Um, maybe what I want to do is have a different icon based on different statuses. So I could flip to this status piece. I can remove the need for a status ring because I'm going to be in your face. I'm going to turn off um, you know, the status badge here. And what I can do is actually for each individual status, Patrick, I can customize what that might be. And, and in this case, um, I'm going to choose, I think, uh, you know, thumbs up, right? Yep. Kind of neat. For warning, I'm going to do a little warning case here. For critical, I might flip this to our down, right, and and create kind of a, a, a unique paradigm where, hey, you know, this map, you know, maybe they don't need the iconography so much, but you can certainly see this from a knock screen, you know, 10 mm -hmm. feet back, 20 feet back, and it just makes, again, the, the possibilities endless. 
Well, and I've made the joke before about creating views for your manage management, but this is really a great way to do that because if they just want to know that the environment is stable, right? They're looking for overall status. I mean, you care about the detail when you're troubleshooting, but it makes it really easy to, to provide dashboards to give them the confidence that you're doing great and that the environment and the infrastructure are healthy. And it just makes it quick to, to read, quick to glance at. And then they don't have to feel like they got to really get into the details. They have what they need and then they can go on with the rest of their day. Exactly. And, and you know, to your point, I mean, look at what we're looking at here. I, I don't have to page jump. I don't have to um, you know, go to a different module to look at things. We've incorporated things from NPM, from SAM, from VMAN, from SRM, all in one place and easy to look at. And again, don't forget people that you can nest maps in inside of each other. So you can have that simple executive roll up that's just those, again, thumbs up, thumbs down or whatever. If I wanted to be a skull and crossbones or something to really stick out, I could do anything. Um, we, so we've, we've seen some pretty stuff. we've seen some pretty creative maps already from our from our customers and um, uh, especially during the beta period and I, that that was a point I did want to make too and we talked about it in Thwack Camp last year but the big difference sort of in terms of overall platform uh, performance improvements between these maps and the old maps is the old maps had to go do that roll up that status roll up in real time in this case Orion is the Orion platform is constantly recalculating that especially with the cleanup of statuses and simplification and some of the dynamic that you have over roll-up status. So that's all happening in the background in real time. And so that way, if you want to do deeply nested maps of maps of maps, you're not incurring additional query, SQL, and Swickle query time every time someone loads a page with a map. So it makes it a lot easier to just put them wherever you need them without incurring a, a, a display penalty or a, a processing Tax. penalty yep. on the overall platform. Yep. Now, speaking of status, that was a great little segue into kind of the crescendo here, right? Because we could spend all day about this. I didn't get to show, you know, shapes and text boxes and we could insert images. And like you said, I have tons of examples out on Thwack. Customers are starting to share their examples, but let's get we're to- gonna, And we're gonna show a Nutanix example of that a little bit later. Oh, nice, nice. So, so, but there's one piece here that we haven't talked about and that's really this track history option. Okay, Patrick, so let me see, we've gone back to kind of my summary page, and this is just my lab and just general examples, but let me see if I can find an example where you can specifically show off that time travel feature. Right? Mm -hmm. And there you got, the, you got the orange iconography for that map. Yeah, and you see I did the blue background again. Sorry, I'm partial blue. Oh, Here's yeah. a white version. This might work, and I've paired it with, you know, perf stacks per perfect. stuff. But I think I have one here where it was more similar to the, the map that we created, so maybe we'll stick with this, right? So... Again, I can choose to add more widgets to this view, this dashboard, if I want to. But of course, we have view mode, which toggles me into the full screen kind of interactive mode. And this is where I can really troubleshoot, right? If I want to start hovering over items and all those types of things, I get status on uh, associated metrics. It looks like uh, the Active Directory application actually on these two servers is having a problem here. What about those cases where... We're coming in after a weekend, Patrick, and somebody complained about something and, you know. It's a it's an email, not a ticket. But I mean, exactly. that, that really is it, is that troubleshooting half the time, by the time you get time to look at it, especially for non you know, severity one issues, some time has passed and you need to actually go back and look. And you could go look at the histograms, but it's easier to look at it in context. Right. I mean, if, if I had to jump through each one of these things and figure out what the impact was or what they impacted, right, it's a lot easier in a map. And you're right. I mean, a lot of times everything that we're doing as far as coming back to troubleshoot is reactive. So why not give customers a little bit of a heads up with this option to view history? So you have that option to enable that track history. And I can jump into this fully interactive mode. And now I can click view history of this map. And what it does is give me a new timeline down here at the bottom. So Patrick, you were complaining about an issue that happened, you know, yesterday. Again, by default, we kind of go back seven days in history. We kind of grab snapshots at 10 minute intervals. I can go back to when it was clean, you know, prior to the problem. Right. You can even do some fun things and play this historical loop. And watch as the little indicator at the bottom of the timeline there kind of flips through the different segments and shows me that from the metrics on the map, the entities on the map, their status has changed, all the different things will recalculate and show me time after time. It's pretty, pretty sweet. 
Yeah, and time travel is one of those things. I think the first place that it appeared was in Virtualization Manager, where you needed to be able to look at the topology for how VMs were organized. Um, then you saw it again in uh, NetPath, right? So that is something that I see us continuing, I see your teams continuing to move across multiple products, and I, I'm always a, a fan whenever I see it. Exactly right. Now, what's the next logical step here usually? it's We don't have hovers because it's not current data, right? right. So we figured out a unique solution to kind of give customers you know, a little bit added benefit. So you'll see I have um, you know, 4.23 a.m. is when that problem, I was asleep, right? This is what my administrator showed me about. I was able to use the map and go back, but what was the cause or what was the reason that I see the thing that's down? Well, I can click on this and what it will do is automatically pull me up a perf stack using our other tool that allows us to correlate information events, gives me an hour before, an hour after that timestamp, um, allows me to, to click into this guy and I can see there were a lot of different problems going on with ADM and the connections between other servers and kind of start doing real time monitoring, whatever I needed to do um, to, to isolate and, and identify that issue, Patrick, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and the only tip there is when you create the map, there is that toggle uh, to retain the uh, t uh, time information or previous maps. Like what's it, what, I, track the, history. Track, track history. history. Yep. And you'll need to make sure you enable that. And the reason that it's not on by default is maybe you don't want to put that in the database. So that gives you the option of how much data do you want to collect versus do you want it for particular maps or not. And you turn it up, just flip that, and it'll start storing that data. Yep. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. This, this has been fantastic. The platform updates here, and we're going to see that now across multiple uh, modules um, on Orion and some of the things that they've been able to do with these capabilities. Um, but it's always a pleasure to get to chat, and um, thanks again for being a part of the segment. Thank you very much. Hopefully we didn't take up too much of your time, Patrick, and you could squeeze everything else in. We could spend all day on this. But uh, again, people can reach out to me on Thwack. We're very active out here. Um, you know, appreciate the time and getting to show you guys this. Really had fun. So hopefully you're as excited as I am about some of the feature updates for the platform. Now let's look at some of the new features that are included across the Orion modules and the security products. So to start, we're going to talk about network performance management and monitoring. And for that, please welcome Joe Reeves. Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, Patrick. It's good to see you again and uh, good to see you virtually in this uh, time of COVID. It's all about upstream bandwidth. Uh, yeah, so thanks again for being a part of this episode. I mean, e e just what we already talked about with Platform, this is an enormous episode. And of course, we want to spend a lot of time talking about the new features that have been added into some of the module releases um, for network performance monitoring. And you actually have, I think, at one point or another, managed most of the modules in Orion. And right now, you're the product manager for NTA and VNQM. That's right, that's right. Yeah. So this 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 release, um, we are extending the, the the breadth of visibility across uh, multiple modules. Um, we're delivering some key integrations that are going to make your life easier, and we've got a lot to cover. So uh, uh, we'll be uh, talking about features here that help extend your visibility into your hybrid environment and do some hybrid uh, uh, management uh, in your Azure uh, network, surface uh, some east-west uh, traffic visibility down in your uh, virtualized environment. Um, we'll be able to handle edge device configuration a little bit more gracefully than we have in the past. Um, we'll do some uh, uh, talk about some key integrations with IPAM uh, and IP group management. Um, we'll supercharge your device firmware updates, uh, and uh, we'll give you some additional visibility into some of your SD-WAN edge devices. It's going to be a lot to cover, and this, I think, will probably be about the biggest uh, segment because certainly we've got lots of customers that are using these products. What do you want to start with? Well, let's get started with uh, Azure Network Gateways. So Azure Network Gateways gives you some visibility between your network and your Azure environment. And this will monitor the, the VPN gateway and site-to-site -site bandwidth. Um, and right. this actually shares some uh, configuration and some components with uh, SAM and, and VMAN. So let's take a look at uh, how you get there. Uh, from the, the home menu here, we'll go to our cloud uh, configuration. And what you'll notice is uh, there's an additional widget here for uh, gateway traffic by region. So in and out gateway traffic by region. Um, the pull-out menu over here will take you to individual virtual network gateways. 
uh, or to site-to-site -site connections. If we click on the region, though, we'll go to a filtered view of our gateways. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So these are our Azure network gateways. Um, you can filter those if you've got a long list of those by the account, the gateway type, uh, location is already pre-selected here, uh, the status uh, or um, the virtual network that these guys are supporting. Uh, selecting these individually will give you a perf stack integration, and I'll show you what that looks like. We'll click on uh, one of these gateways here. That'll uh, allow you to take a look at uh, bandwidth in and out uh, over time. And I think the thing that's really driving that, right, is that when you move applications to cloud, and since hybrid is forever, um, you, you, a lot of times you find out that an application that was fine on your LAN is actually pretty expensive to pull data out of or maybe con uh, consuming a lot of resources. So is the goal here to really be able to just pull those in as uh, alongside of all of your other, other bandwidth metrics? Exactly. And so when you select uh, all of your gateways, um, this will go ahead and populate all of those into PerfStack, and you'll be able to do uh, comparisons between those two. Lab environment, uh, not fully populated, but you'll be able to see how you can stack those up against each other. One other way of looking at your Azure network gateways is by um, the individual VPNs. And so in this pull-out menu over here, you can select the individual VPNs. And again, there's some flexibility in terms of how you filter those by account, by encryption type, gateway, and so forth. And once again, with these, you'll be able to open these up in PerfStack and look at these on a VPN by VPN basis and see the tunnel traffic that is specific to this particular VPN tunnel. And then a lot of times, use, uh, customers are also monitoring the VPN specifics, maybe for an ASA or another appliance, where they can actually look to see what the real bandwidth is. And if there's a, a linking state error or something else, they'll drill down into that level of detail too. It's a very similar presentation to what you've, you've seen in uh, some of our other VPN monitoring. Okay, thanks, Joe. I mean, I, we hate to you know admit it. We thought, well, I think some people thought hybrid was going to be for a little while, and the reality is it's going to be forever. And so one of those first big steps is gaining visibility into the cloud gateways. And uh, this is really, really helpful. Um, the second one, of course, is that you still have an awful lot of traffic that you're trying to monitor on-prem, especially in between hypervisors or individual VMs. So Talk to us a little bit about uh, VDS support in uh, VMware. Okay. The VMware Virtual Distributed Switch um, extends this kind of uh, virtualized switching fabric across multiple hypervisors. And it gives you some insight into the conversations that are occurring between VMs that are hosted on each of these uh, hypervisors. And so the virtual distributed switch uses um, the IP fix flow format to report on these conversations. And depending on how you have it configured, those conversations will either show up as being all reported by the switch itself, if you assign an IP address to the switch, or they'll show up as being reported by the hypervisor. And that'll give you some insight into what traffic is associated with each hypervisor. Now, in both cases, the traffic is actually coming from the virtual distributed switch. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what this actually looks like in, in NTA. So I'll navigate over here to uh, my NTA summary. We're going to take a look at the sources of flow information. And you can see right off the bat, we've got a bunch of hypervisors here that are listed as sources. I'll show you another change for this release. In this release, we've actually separated out flow sources management to either show you a collection of interfaces or nodes. So we've really tried to reduce some of the clutter in this screen. Let's take a look at nodes, and we'll do uh, a quick uh, filter here to pull up uh, a handful of hypervisors. You'll notice that these are listed as ESX servers, uh, as sources of flow information. This is actually coming from the switch. But if we click on this, we'll be able to see traffic that's actually uh, associated with VMs on each of these hypervisors. And so it looks just like NetFlow from any other source. Exactly. So it's very easy to find, very easy to navigate, and very easy to associate uh, traffic with a particular hypervisor. So you said something before that was interesting, which is you could choose to receive that either from the hypervisor 
sort of the virtual switch level or the individual application. And that's what's a, really interesting to me because I can't tell you how many times I V motion something and then all of a sudden I run into unexpected bandwidth or maybe resource or where the network really wasn't tuned for an application. I didn't know until I moved that workload. So is that really the goal there to be able to monitor east-west regardless of where that VM happens to be? Yeah, this gives you insight into application architectures. So what part of the applications are talking to each other? So if I pick up a VM and I move it across the data center, I'll have an understanding of what kinds of conversations I might pull across my physical switches. And likewise, if I want to pick up that particular VM and that workload and move that to public cloud, I'll be able to understand what kinds of conversations uh, are associated with other workloads in that environment, and I might have to move as well. Now, this does bring us to something else, which actually dovetails into a previous uh, top ranked and voted up feature request, which is how do you keep track of multiple flows that may actually be on a single host uh, where you're not double reporting that data? Right. So let's roll into uh, uh, the next feature, which is um, node reconciliation. So in node reconciliation, we're basically providing you a mechanism to tell NTA when your edge router device um, configuration could result in situations where we are double counting traffic and then we'll handle that more gracefully within the application. So for this, I'm going to um, I'm going to point to a THWAC posting that goes into some level of detail about node reconciliation, and I'll show you what this looks like. So you can find this on THWAC in the NTA forum, um, and this goes in and provides some background on this challenge that we have with um, mixed configurations of uh, edge router devices. And this is a this has been a chronic problem, I think, um, based on how certain vendors permit you to configure um, the way that flows are exported. So uh, in this, uh, to use this feature, we'll navigate to flow sources again, and we'll select one of our edge router devices, um, you can see in the background here. And then we will bring up a dialog that says reconcile node. And in that dialog, we'll be able to specify on an interface-by-interface -interface basis how we have configured the interfaces to export flow. So in some cases, we've got interfaces that may be uh, exporting only ingress records or only egress records, some that are exporting both ingress and egress. And in uh, in situations where we have some interfaces configured to export flow in one direction and some in both directions, that can actually result in double counting the traffic as it transits through the node. So this feature allows you to reconcile NTA's view of the actual configuration, handle that correctly, and represent the traffic correctly. So you're effectively giving it hints about what it should do with that data that's being collected. Exactly. And then you'll be able to see uh, accurate uh, traffic volumes through the node as well as through the interface. Well, I know that's been requested a long time, and um, hopefully we get some great feedback on how that's working. Okay, another big area comes when uh, organization or of traffic, especially where you're trying to map sort of the business's view of traffic to the actual underlying infrastructure. And I think we use IP groups for that, or a lot of customers are using IP groups for that. But there's been some extensions that actually make it a lot easier to manage in one place and then tie it into IPAM. That's right. So we've built a, a new integration with IPAM. It's been requested for quite some time that allows us to surface uh, IPAM uh, authored IP groups into NTA and use that. And so let me show you what that looks like. First, we'll navigate over to um, IP address management here. If I can find it, there we go. IP addresses, manage subnets and IP addresses. And one of the things you'll notice in IPAM is that um, there are organizations of subnets. We've structured these subnets together. Usually they either represent business groups, uh, business units, or they represent geographies. Um, and so users of IPAM take quite a bit of time uh, to structure their subnets into something logical and understandable. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is leverage that same kind of organization and grouping over in NTA without having to rebuild it from scratch. So let's see what that looks like in NTA. 
So we'll go over to uh, our NTA summary. We'll take a look at the NTA NetFlow settings here. We'll navigate from NetFlow settings, and we'll look at where we manage um, IP address groups here. Now, we've completely redesigned this page. And we'll go ahead and dismiss that. And in this page, what you'll see is that you've got a collection of IP groups that are either managed by NTA or managed by IPAM. If they're managed by IPAM, you can't change them in NTA, but you can reference them, import them, and use them. And then that's pretty powerful. Um, we've added a new feature here to import IPAM groups. And so you'll see the IPAM group structure that we looked at just a moment ago. And uh, by selecting the groups that we want to manage, we will surface those in NTA. Now, you'll notice that um, IPAM's got a hierarchical structure. Um, so we can import individual subnets over here, or we can import um, a single group that encompasses all of the subnets. So you'll notice if I click all of those, I'm going to get five groups here. And so I can work at different levels of granularity uh, inside of um, NTA. I was going to say, if you're configuring those inside, those groups inside of IPAM, then changing group membership will automatically be uh, reflected in these groups as well, right? Exactly. So as you make changes to those in IPAM, they'll automatically be reflected in, uh, in NTA. Now, if you don't have IPAM and you're just creating uh, IP address groups, we've also added a little bit of flexibility here um, in terms of how we define uh, new groups in NTA. And so you can define those by uh, using a range, which is a facility that we had uh, before this, an individual address, or you can use the CIDR notation now. Um, that has been a pet peeve of mine. We've added that. Um, makes life a lot easier for constructing groups uh, in NTA alone. So let's see what we can do with these um, in uh, NTA itself. So we're going to navigate over here, and we're going to start with the Flow Navigator. And so you're familiar with how to use the Flow Navigator. First off, we'll select a source of our flow information. So we'll look at a particular node here, and we'll select an application that we're interested in. So for Flow uh, Alerts, um, we specify a particular application, and then we'll look at application volumes. So let's take a look at... Um, just our HTTPS traffic here. Now we'll go down and we can either specify an endpoint or an IP address group. So this is where we can start to use some of the groups that we have imported uh, from IPAM. And so we'll add that to our filter, we'll submit that, and now we'll have a filtered view of traffic uh, for the East Data Center IP group um, that is HTTPS traffic. So if I want to write a flow alert for that, one of the things you'll notice now when I uh, go to create a flow alert is that I have a specification now for the IP address group that I've included. And that means I can write a much more specific uh, flow alert that pertains to that group. Oh, I just love that because that is one of those things where, especially if you're doing you know, a little bit of social engineering, like you're trying to get people to watch their own consumption of maybe non-critical business uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, but the problem is then if you write a lot of really specific alerts that are tied to IPs or hosts or something else or, or, or interfaces, you risk sort of spamming everybody. And so I guess the goal here is to reduce that, uh, to make that specificity of alerting to reduce the number of uh, alerts that people can uh, disregard. Exactly. I can be very precise about um, the alert that I'm writing. So, for example, if I want to look at traffic that falls off of a particular individual host and goes to zero, um, I can specify an individual endpoint here and, and then submit that. And when I go to create my alert definition, um, then I can use a form of the alert where I say um, my traffic now is less than or equal to uh, zero, right? And I can detect a condition where uh, traffic has fallen off completely from this individual node. Very, very precise uh, kind of an alert. 
I think this is going to be really helpful, and I'm really looking forward to all of the feedback from you on Thwack um, about how you're going to use this alert capability. And that between that and flow reconciliation and then being able to really pull data from uh, VMware uh, switches, that I think is going to be really, really cool. So uh, thanks for walking us through those. Um, there were also a couple of really cool updates for NCM, um, especially in terms of being able to, I don't know, deploy faster. Yes, absolutely. Let's take a quick look at uh, NCM. We'll look at network configuration here, and we'll look at our firmware upgrades. So uh, we've made some changes to allow you to, um, to run multiple firmware upgrade jobs in parallel. We're not serializing those anymore, and that allows you to make better use of your very precious maintenance windows and keep your environment uh, secure and up-to-date with the latest set of patches. Now, of course, anytime I hear about parallelization, I want to make sure that I can control that. So you can actually do a hybrid, right? You can have some that are deployed all at the same time, but then maybe for a core or something else where there is actually a, a set of dependencies for the order that they need to be pushed out, you can still do that as well. You can still do that. You'll need to structure those jobs, though. Um, there's no uh, dependency management yet, but you can structure those um, to to do a batch uh, in parallel and then do uh, an additional job then um, that uh, is dependent on those. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so that should result in faster deployments for firmware. All right, then the last thing is actually better visualization for branch office networks. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a feature for uh, the Viptela uh, SD-WAN Edge devices. Um, and it's an integration with uh, UDT to be able to visualize uh, devices that are currently plugged in or um, uh, the history of devices that have been plugged in uh, to that device out at the branch. Because it's not always convenient to walk to the wiring closet and see what's plugged in. Well, Joe, thank you so much for walking us through these uh, feature updates that are part of this release. And I mean, this is just for uh, networking tools. Um, one of the things that's interesting here is I saw a to me, a much snappier interface. So it looks like you were able to pick up a lot of the performance improvements in terms of how fast things render, whether they're updating in real time, the ease of use of a lot of the, the dialogues that have been updated. So uh, that's one area where we're gonna love to get some feedback from all of you, because these are the tools that you probably are spending most of your time in. And just in terms of configuration and like watching the uh, IP group configuration, um, It'll be really great to get your feedback. So let make sure you let us know on Thwack. And uh, Joe, where can they reach you? They can reach me at Jay Reeves on Thwack. Um, and so that's probably the best way to, to message me directly. I would love to hear how you're using some of these features in your operational environment. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being part of this segment. You bet. So hopefully you're already getting a sense for how many new features have been added as a part of this upgrade. So let's switch from talking about networks to talk about systems, administration, and servers. And to do that, please welcome James Barnes. Systems product manager to the star, to the stars, James Barnes. James, how you doing? Doing great, Patrick. Thanks for that uh, rousing introduction. <laughs> I think you might be one of the best known product managers for the systems management products in Thwack. And at this point, you've owned pretty much all of the systems management products at some point or another. That's right. From A to Z, I've had uh, everything from SAM to WPM at this point. So uh, I've uh, probably encountered just about everyone on Thwack at this point. Well, there have been a lot of updates as a part of 2020.2 for the systems monitoring products. Um, so. I guess the driver behind this is really, I mean, you hear us talk about hybrid IT a lot, but that really is kind of where the world is now, right? Yeah. I mean, we know that IT pros need support and monitoring tools to adapt to this you know, ever-changing hybrid IT environment that everyone's always talking about, and they need to do that without missing a beat. Uh, the latest versions of our systems management solutions hopefully can help you do that. All right. Well, we're going to start with probably a you know obvious favorite that I might just be slightly interested in, and that's going to be API monitoring. So this is something we, we introduced this before in the last release, but this is something really different. So talk to us about that. That's right. Uh, we started last version with the uh, introduction to the API polling, and now we've expanded that, made it better, made it easier. Um, and part of that, you know, a, a very big part of that was that we introduced some new templates based upon those API pollers, strictly aimed at the cloud-related resources. So as you may remember, we had have had for a long time uh, classic SAM templates, if you will, based on the 
PowerShell script components uh, that were, you know, would allow you to get at those cloud-based resources. But folks found a lot of shortcomings in those, not not the least of which was the fact that your credentials were kind of stored directly in there. Uh, it was hard to kind of manage that. It wasn't very scalable, maybe not so secure. So we made it better with these uh, API-based templates. And, uh, you know, you can see that now in this new release. Yeah, I think these started as a way of regaining visibility sort of down to the mailbox level for Office 365, where somebody had you know migrated off of an on-prem exchange environment, for example. Uh, so I guess these were started in THWAC, and then they were curated by SolarWinds, and then now they've actually been productionized. And one of the things that you mentioned there is that you're saying that the uh, credentials are now part of the encrypted uh, credential store like any other resource, right? Exactly. As, as any time you're building one of these API-based pollers, you can put the credentials there, they're stored appropriately versus the old method of, you know, having them just kind of sitting in the script component itself. Okay, well, so let's start with, uh, how about a map? I think that'd be a great way to visualize this. So walk us through what a typical application is where it's a composite uh, combining a bunch of different monitoring uh, techniques. Sure. So yeah, let's take a look at this this image we have here. It's a lovely image kind of built around that lovely Orion map stuff that we're talking so much about these days. Uh, but what you can see from this is that it's, uh, you know, clearly centered on, you know, Azure in the middle here. And then you've kind of got the highways running north and south, east and west. If you follow any of those to their logical conclusion, you can see that this is truly hybrid. This is on-prem stuff connected to cloud stuff. The Azure AD is really focused heavily in that. Um, if you look closely at some of the parts of this map, you'll see there's API pollers reflected, standard polling. Um, so it's just a great way to take all of this new goodness in SAM and tie it together with one of the platform level things in, in Orion Maps. What I, what I really love about this, too, is that it really does make those first-class citizens in terms of data, right? So in this case right here, right, you've got um, processes that are running in Azure that may be monitored through any number of different APIs. Azure itself, on-prem, and then the connectivity to it. But um, it looks like right on the right-hand side there, when you created this map, you just dragged them over out of the catalog of available metrics, but in, they're just being provided by these API templates. Does that also work in Perf stack and AppStack? Yeah, absolutely. The, these these relationships are the basis of everything now. So you don't have to go create those manually or you know dream them up. They're they're just kind of there to, as you said, kind of in the toolbox. Just grab them and drag them. Okay. And the README file for Sam is going to actually uh, go through step by step how to how to use those templates, right? There's always documentation if you want it, Patrick. <laughs> okay, good. Well, because we just don't have time to show it because there's so much else that we've got in this episode. All right, right, so next up, um, you're really excited about this, and I am because it really is the beginning of uh, hyperconverged visualization, right? And so that's going to be mapping for Nutanix. That's right. Uh, we aim to, to do a better job of supporting mixed environments. And of course, Nutanix is big in that arena. Uh, you know, when you've got, uh, you know, not only hyper-converged is, you know, certainly a buzzword we could harp on there, but, you know, Nutanix is the first time where you start to see things kind of stacked on top of one another. You know, Nutanix can host Hyper-V, it can host VMR VMware, um, you know, so we yes, obviously- platform as a service. That's right. And so we needed to, you know, anybody who was with us for the previous release or has been with us for a while knows that we already had the Nutanix support in there, but only at the tech preview level. And this now coming up here from 2020.2, we've gotten away from that tech preview mantle. This is fully supported. It's no longer tech preview realm. Uh, and, you know, to kind of round that out some of the things that we've added are things like storage views at the cluster and host and vm level didn't have those before now we've got cpu and memory and network usage at the cluster and vmware level so uh, a far more expanded view of what's going on inside the nutanix environment and of course as you already alluded to uh, that means you know that it's all going to look very very nice in a map so maybe let's uh, let's take a look at an example here and then you've got your Nutanix uh, logo right there in the center, of course, with the copyright mark. But that's not just to indicate that this is a map. I mean, it's to visualize it, you know, in this example. But this isn't some just monitoring that we're doing. This is actually because we're a technology partner with Nutanix. This is on their website. That's right. There, there's a relationship there, and uh, we, we we're, we're proud to be part of that. Awesome. So talk, uh, talk to us about what you got here. 
Well, it's just a very simple representation of a Nutanix environment, uh, you know, from everything from the, the, the clusters to the the storage containers, uh, the CVM is reflected there. Just really anything that you would expect to find in your Nutanix environment is is right there at your fingertips. Again, it's in the it's a lot of it's going to be built for you, but anything that you think you might want to add, Orion Maps gives us that ability. Just reach in the tool tray and, and add the things that you need to add. Right. So just like anything else, it's part of app stack or per stack or one of the common other metrics or relationships. You may have things that are part of your application. It might be down to the OS level or traffic level or something else where you want to ta- you want to have uh, performance for a service. That's not something that Nutanix is aware of, but it's something that the Orion platform is aware of. So it allows you to combine those together and create that view of all the components of an application, even if some of them are essentially in your PaaS platform or in traditional infrastructure or even out in the cloud. That's right. Yeah, you can kind of think of yourself as an as an artist and you've got a palette of colors and, you know, Orion is providing that palette of colors. So it doesn't have to be coming directly from Nutanix. I could add environments, uh, you know, that are related to it, but not necessarily directly. Like you said, Nutanix may not be aware of the things that are running on top of it, but you can certainly make the map reflect that reality. Awesome. Okay, next up would be storage. This would be storage resource monitor. Uh, more controllers, right? That's right. Uh, We always try to, with each release, we strive to expand that portfolio of controllers that we not only support outright, but obviously there are times when we want to add a little more depth to that support. Maybe last time we didn't quite get to the level that the customers were looking for. So we continued that story. You know, uh, NetApp in seven mode, you uh, now have hardware health there. Uh, And with VNX Clarion, uh, people were looking for a little more information, extended information about the controllers. So we've got that as uh, available as well and actually real quick here let me just uh, pull up a couple of images and we'll look at what that looks like so here is that extended controller support and here we have a netapp in seven mode that is reflecting hardware health everything green Yep, there's all the details. And it, this is one of those things where every time we do a major release, it feels like we add a couple of more. And so at this point, in terms of uh, in terms of controllers uh, and arrays, there are now dozens, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the list is very long and, and very comprehensive. Of course, uh, we seek to increase that every time, but uh, it's hard to find an array we don't support now. Yeah, I think all you know. Uh, if you're a storage manager uh, and you hear people talk about hybrid IT, you're like, uh, storage has been hybrid for you know as long as they can <laughs> remember, right? Okay, so uh, the next one, another number one uh, feature request, uh, has been upvoted for a really long time, and that is flat file monitoring for Windows servers. That's right, log analyzer. We decided to add a new log source for you. So anyone who's been along for the ride knows we already had syslog and traps. And in previous recent releases, we added native support for Windows events and, of course, native support for VMware events. But this new log source, which is flat log files on Windows hosts, was very highly requested from customers. And, you know, basically what that means is you're going to be able to utilize the agent, uh, the standard Orion agent that you're probably already using on a lot of those nodes anyway. Uh, This is just a plug-in on top of that. And so it's going to uh, go and get those flat log files, whether they're Apache or MySQL or maybe, hey, even Orion running on your Windows machine. Or, or it, a custom application that's spitting or, out some log. That's right. And, you know, anything you could dream up uh, that's running on that host that's spitting out a log app, or an application log, uh, is going to certainly be uh, valid for this. And and it's the other part of it is we, we strove to make this easy. So basically in the log analyzer settings, there's a place now where you go and you build a profile and it's simply a matter of give me the path to the log files, give me a wildcard if there's numerous log files there that you want to collect and we basically do the rest of the work for you you don't have to um, you know traditionally doing this work would have required a powershell script or a Perl script on the sam component monitor side uh, mm-hmm. this this makes it uh, easier because you don't have to understand scripting and it also makes it more real time you know sam is still going to be based on a polling interval and not that that's bad but oftentimes with log events you want to be really right and it's gonna and it's gonna be based real on time. Yeah, and it's going to be based on the amount of log data that's available. If there's nothing coming out in the log, it's not going to take up any time. Uh, I think what I really like about it, to your point there, is I mean, I, I love to script, but this is going to make it a lot easier because then you don't have a script that's PowerShell or Perl or who knows what else. Um, and then the other thing is because it's using the agent framework, it'll also support client push as well. So if you have someone who maybe, I don't know, is remote, who normally would be on-prem, where you can't pull that agent, you can actually do page uh, 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 
client initiated to push that that agent data out as well. Yeah, that's right. This it, it's anything that the Orion agent could already do is going to follow suit here. There's there's no twists or turns. It's the basic agent that you're used to. Just now, it can do log file ingestion for log analyzer. All right. So last up, um, this one is a favorite. It was been it's been requested a lot, and that is you've extended the recorder that's used for W uh, for WPM uh, Web Performance Monitor so that it can also save those uh, recordings for playback on Pingdom. That's right. Uh, so it's you know many people have been telling us since we bought Pingdom, which has been many years now, that they'd love to see these two products come closer together. And so we're starting to take that path. We're going down that path. And this is step one. Uh, basically, go into the recorder, create your recording, create your transaction. Uh, and when you're done, you have now a, a, a fork in the road that you can take. You can still save it to Orion, of course, but now you could also save it to Pingdom and run that transaction directly from Pingdom. So you can take advantage of the Pingdom infrastructure to run those, uh, or you can save it to your traditional Orion infrastructure. Do you have a screen we could look at? I absolutely do. So here you can see the recorder interface. Uh, if you kind of gl glance to the upper right, you're gonna see there that now, truly enough, there is an option to save to Pingdom. And here, uh, you know, I'm saving my recording to Pingdom. And here it is listed in a inventory of transactions running on Pingdom itself. So that's the Pingdom interface, not the Orion interface. That's right. That, that's the big thing here is this is your, uh, we've drilled all the way into the detail now, and this is our transaction that we recorded in the recorder running directly on Pingdom. And the thing I love about that, too, is that you've got the option in that save dialog to either save it local, so maybe if you have change control or something else, you want to just have backups of it. Um, you can save it directly into the Orion platform uh, for WPM, or if you wanted to, you could even pull one that's in the, that you're running internally, maybe, load it up inside the editor, and then push it to Pingdom as well. So you can move them between those two environments. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the recorder is is able to kind of act as the pivot point there. So you can pull something, you open the recorder, open something from Orion, edit it, do whatever you're going to do with it, and then decide, do I want to save this back to Orion or do I want to now move this out to my, my Pingdom account? All right. Well, James, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today uh, and to go over all of these updates across the systems monitoring products. No problem. It's my pleasure. And of course, if anyone has any other comments, questions, concerns, or otherwise, you know where to find me on Thwack. I think everybody knows where to find you on Thwack at this point, James. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about updates to the database performance monitoring products. Joining us now, please welcome John Maxwell, Senior Product Marketing Manager for SolarWinds Database Products. Hey, Patrick. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here because this release is something that both the product team and our customers have been waiting for for a long time. Uh, the DPA 2020.2 release, we're really highlighting our new Postgres support. Postgres support is very important for a couple of reasons. One, for really the past year and a half, it's been the number one most requested feature on Thwack. So we're really excited to add this support into DPA since so many of our customers, they're adding open source databases like Postgres support can now have that support in DPA. Um, you know, sep separate from this being a, a, a major uh, ask from the customer base, a lot of people don't realize that Postgres now, according to the website dbengines.com, is actually the fourth most popular database out there. And we're certainly seeing both uh, new customers and even existing customers who have, you know, have large Oracle and, and SQL Server implementations they're adding Postgres to the mix. So we're really excited about this release. I think the now, thing that, I was gonna say, I think the thing that I'm most excited about it is actually sort of a little bit more of the enterprise side is that you're also supporting um, the enterprise extensions or the Oracle extensions for Postgres for users who transitioned to Postgres from Oracle and then are trying to kind of catch up with the manageability that they previously had with the direct Oracle support. Well, and let's cover the databases or the instances of Postgres we, we support. So if you look at the slide that's now up on the screen, you'll notice that we went uh, full-blown support for Postgres. So we have the, of course, native Postgres support that you get from postgresql.org. So that's the you know open source version. Uh, we also support uh, enterprise DB Postgres. 
And that is the um, version of Postgres that has a uh, Oracle compatibility mode. And that is for customers that uh, would might be transitioning applications to Postgres. So we support the native open source. We support the enterprise DB Postgres with that Oracle compatibility. And there's three more uh, platforms for Postgres we support. We support uh, two of the, the popular Amazon implementations of Postgres. One is RDS for Postgres. And the second is... Um, Amazon Aurora Postgres. So uh, two of the uh, big name popular uh, implementations in Amazon. And of course, last but not least, you know, DP already has broad Azure support. So we've added Azure database for Postgres uh, support in Azure also. Oh, and then I want to mention yeah, for the on-prem versions, uh, we do support uh, Postgres running in both a Linux and Windows server. Uh, I, I've already started to get that questions a lot about, you know, um, you know what 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 servers are you supporting? We support Linux um, and Windows. Well, that's the so, thing that I really love about this is it's is that y'all didn't start with just a couple of features and then build out. I think a lot of the conversation that we we're seeing on Thwack and the user community, and certainly when we're you know out talking at, at uh, Swags and other events, is that. Postgres tends to be used in a lot of different ways, and teams, are, our customers are constantly evolving how they're using it. And so to say it was limited to a certain subset was going to be part of the problem because one of the great things about Postgres is you can use it in so many different ways. And so that really drove the decision to release all of these features with the introduction of this support. Now, we certainly, in addition to the uh, broad support of Postgres platforms, we didn't skimp when it comes to functionality. And what I'd like to do now, let me switch to the demo so I can go through the core functionality that, that users may be used to when it comes to Oracle or SQL Server Postgres. And then I'll go into some uh, of the new functionality that's specific to Postgres. All right, let's walk through the product. I wanna highlight really three specific areas. Um, some of the new options uh, that have changed uh, uh, they have to do with Postgres and other databases. Then I'll compare uh, the existing features that we have that support Postgres along with some of the new features. So let's go up here to the Options tab. And you'll notice that you know we have the, the register uh, key and you can go in and see that we've added Postgres. Like I mentioned before, we have the, uh, the native Postgres uh, support along with the EDB Postgres. Uh, we have the options for Amazon, both RDS and Aurora, and then, of course, the Azure database for Postgres. So in addition to having Postgres show up now under the register section, notice down here under administration, we have a new option called Trusted Certificate Management. Now, this is uh, applicable to all databases. So uh, all the databases now that uh, DP monitors will have certificates in the Java Trust Store. But one of the things that we've added specifically for Postgres is the ability to import a certificate into what's called the DPA Trust Store. Uh, and you also have, as you can see from the DB Certificates tab, you have the ability to go in and uh, specify a certificate for a specific database instance. <laughs> So uh, those are two new options uh, that you'll see when you go to the options tab. But I also want to point out uh, something. This is not really applicable, or it wasn't added just for Postgres, but it's a it's a feature again that customers have been wanting, and that's when you go into manage alerts, you go into create an alert. You're going to see a new option, and what I've got down here is notice we now have something called normal. And uh, again, something high on the list of THWAC users, this gives you the ability to do a notification either you know, to yourself or to a group of people, or more importantly, to some automation tool to basically say the, uh, the alert that we hit has now gone back with the normal ranges. So, so basically, the problem no longer exists. Right. So, so I just wanted to call that be out. Be able to automatically resolve a, uh, an, uh, an issue. Absolutely. So three, three kind of you know, housekeeping type issues I want to talk about. Now let's go in and let's select a Postgres database. Now one of the things, uh, this is one of our labs, 
if you hover on this and you get a message, uh, an error message, you do have to, and this is in the admin guide, you have to do set some uh, PG uh, stats information on. So for example, this one, you have to enable PG stats statements for us to collect um, certain levels of information. So if you hover on this and you see like a little weird error message, just go to the admin guide and we'll, uh, you know, we'll note the, the things that you have to turn on for Postgres. So a little different from some of the other databases we support. But what I love about this, uh, again, in addition to that broad support is, you know, it looks very familiar, right? It looks just as if you're going to Oracle and to SQL Server and to MySQL. So we have the uh, machine learning anomaly detection. We have the ability to look at the worst performing statements. Notice when I go up here into tuning, um, now I have my query advisors so I can see, I can get advice on the uh, worst performing queries. You can see on this one, we have some uh, times of the day where we have very high execution times. Uh, we also, our most significant weight is around memory and CPU, and we can call out and, and delve down into those times. We have all the statistics, including blocking, uh, various transaction rates, row information. We have added some information that I'll go into later about things like the, uh, the wall file, um, and uh, evictions and things like that. Uh, so again, we've incorporated uh, some of the new Postgres stats uh, into this. Um, and then of course, then you'll notice here, if I select on current running transactions, I can go down here, select a specific time. Uh, I can go in, go down to a specific query uh, and notice I have the ability to look at live plans and then I can go ahead and run that live plan to see what it would look like. Again, very familiar with what we do with a lot of the other databases. So you can see now I have the generated plan from uh, Postgres. Well, what's really helpful for me is that, you know, we talk about you know being an accidental DBA. For me, I'm an accidental adjacent DBA. I'm, I'm pretty feel confident with SQL Server, but as I move into different database platforms, you know, that assumption that people will make, oh, well, then you must be able to understand, but they're so diff, a lot of times those databases are really different. And in this case, you're uh, basically normalizing the sort of base functions of database performance analyzers. So, so for example, the ML AI based um, um, alerting for anomaly detection is, uh, is has been extended to include Postgres. But as you were showing before, you were getting also those Postgres specific data types, or in this case, the way that the execution plan works incorporated into those same views. And Patrick, that's our goal is to really have that single pane of glass experience no matter what database you have, because what, what I found just talking with dozens of customers, our typical customer has three or more databases. So we want to provide a consistent approach to pinpointing problems as quickly as possible. Now, the other thing that uh, I do want to show that we brought over for Postgres before I go into some of the new features is virtualization. We do support Postgres running in a VMware virtual machine. And the reason I bring this up is I did a, a THWACK survey recently, and Postgres was one of the top five most virtualized databases. Um, so we do know that people are running Postgres in a VM. And this is one of our most popular uh, virtualization views because you're looking at your top SQL, you look at the um, what's going on from the instance perspective, the virtual mm -hmm. machine, down the physical host and the storage. So this gives you a great time slice of what's going on uh, for that Postgres instance running in a virtual machine. And yeah. noticed, uh, just as we have before, you can look at the current uh, running queries, but this feature is really handy for DBAs because it allows them to see exactly how their virtual machine is configured. Mm -hmm. I got two virtual CPUs, how much memory I have, but also, you know, what host am I running on? What's the physical server? Um, and even, you know, what other VMs are running on that uh, host machine? And of course, uh, least but not last are the resources tab. Now this is from a VM perspective, um, and I'm gonna cover some of the, uh, the, the new features we had for Postgres, but no, no, notice here that I've got CPU. Now, one of the little gotchas we found with Postgres uh, you know, Postgres is not as rich uh, of a database when it comes to, say, an Oracle or SQL Server as far as the data we can collect from it. 
So Postgres actually does not have a feature to collect CPU utilization, but here we're able to collect it from vSphere and give you, um, you know, the, the CPU utilization of Postgres in that virtual machine. But before I get into the rest of uh, the uh, metrics here, let me go back over into the normal view. All right, so we covered basically all the uh, new functionality from uh, a setup perspective. We covered uh, the functionality that we brought over that we support in other databases to show you the the, the rich metrics that we're collecting uh, that are you know generic to Postgres and other databases. But what I wanted to do now was go specifically into some of the new metrics that we added just for Postgres. So I'll click over here on the resources tab and notice we have the usual suspects like memory, disk, sessions, weights. But notice three new tabs here around vacuum, checkpoints, and cache eviction. So vacuum is a very important backend process in Postgres that deals with dead tuples or, or rows that are deleted or modified in Postgres. Vacuum goes in and removes obsolete rows. So you wanna make sure that all those modified or deleted rows are getting removed. And that's why modifying vacuum is a very important, if not one of the most ba uh, important backend processes to look at. Another very important Postgres metric are checkpoints. So with Postgres, it temporarily stores blocks in shared buffers. And then it writes those to a wall file, a write ahead log. And if you remember, I, I covered that when we were looking at a specific query. Um, this, of course, reduces the number of writes to disk, but you want to monitor this because it's important that um, this, you know, backend uh, activity, uh, if it's impacted, you know, you might hit the threshold on your, your write ahead log size or something like that. So, again, a very important metric to monitor. And last but not least is cache eviction. Um, you know, with Postgres, uh, shared buffer cache store is used for change information before it's written to disk for you know obvious reasons for performance and uh, these uh cache eviction uh basically there's uh three back-end ways uh that uh the blocks are, are finally written to disk um and then and that's the uh checkpointer process the writer process and the back-end process so again you you know, cache eviction, checkpoints, and vacuum are, are three very important uh, new features that we added uh, to Postgres. Also, I don't I have time, but uh, we have all kinds of new Postgres reports. So when you go into reports, click on uh, one of your Postgres databases, you'll have uh, a many reporting options up there. And John, I had a question there for you. Um, one of the things that I think you, you mentioned before that a lot of uh, users are actually running Postgres in uh, VMs. Are the vacuum and checkpoint processes and monitoring and alerting, those tend to expose uh, resource contention issues um, where there's a bottleneck that's actually preventing that uh, read-write yeah. activity? Yeah, actually, that's a good question because if, if you are underserved, for example, in disk storage, right, your, your, your wall files can fill up, or if you haven't allocated enough virtual memory um, you know, you may fill up with dirty buffers. So having that VM information is really uh, of paramount importance uh, running Postgres uh, in a so, VM. So a typical troubleshooting workflow um, would be, let's say you have uh, an issue, uh, an air, a uh, alert that's coming out of uh, cache clearing. Um, you're going to then go, let's say if it's virtualized to the virtual virtualization tab and then scroll down to storage. And that's where you typically expect to see that. Absolutely. Okay. And, and again, it, the whole goal is having that single pane of glass, right? Where we're, we're putting the Postgres information, the system information, the virtual machine information, all there uh, for you to see with one view. And you can see on this summary slide, we have uh, two places for you to go. Uh, we have the generic DPA product page, but we've also got a very detailed uh, pr uh, use case page written for DPA that covers really everything I've talked about uh, in detail. Uh, with the new Postgres support, including all the types of Postgres we support, some uh, um, screenshots and, and the like. This has been fantastic. And thanks for going over this. Uh, I, I've talked about Database Performance Analyzer a lot over the years. Um, it has, 
I've actually learned a lot about new databases and things that are that are maybe outside my specialization or at least outside my experience because of the way that it combines metrics and names so that it almost is a Rosetta Stone for me about the way that one database approaches, let's say, cash clearing or, or uh, rights or the way that it's doing uh, block reads or something else. Uh, to another, and it lets me sort of extend what I know about SQL Server and MySQL to other other database types. Um, this has been fantastic, John. Thank you so much for walking us through this. My pleasure. And with that, we're going to switch to security. So we're going to go over to Manya and Ashley to talk about some of the new updates in the 2020.2 release for our security products. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SolarWinds Security Corner. We're very happy to have you. My name is Ashley Adams. I'm in Austin, Texas, and uh, a product marketing manager. Today with me, I have Manya. She's in our Berlin office, and she's going to cover along with me some of the latest, greatest features from SCM, ARM, and SEM. Um, these are going to help you to better manage, detect um, any potential threats, and up-level your security posture. So with that, I will give it over to Manya. So, hey everybody from Berlin, and actually today is a great day talking about all the news, and let's get started with a server configuration monitor. And with SCM, as we like to call it internally, we enhance the capabilities to monitor uh, your databases uh, for changes to table and index structures um, for users, permissions, and uh, resource configurations for SQL Server. Postgres and um, MySQL servers. So let me take you into the demo for a second. Looking at the demo right now, you see a list of uh, your server configuration nodes. So you see all your servers, and then you can drill down into the number of um, profiles you have assigned to them. You also see a baseline number of mismatches. And of course, we allow you to drill down into a detailed um, configuration page. And by going there, you can choose a profile with a baseline mismatch. So right now from here, you can click into one of those. And um, what you're going to see is a before and an after situation. So um, we allow you to see your situation before you had any configurations happening and then your after situation. And obviously, there's a mismatch. And this is going to help you to um, mitigate any things happening in your server setup changes. So um, from here, you can take over and just edit your changes, save that, and go back to a more um, configured situation. So with that, taking it over to ARM, which, as I said before, is focusing on like uh, hybrid IT as the number one feature. And there has been some more tiny teeny features that we added, but overall, um, we increased the number of uh, resources you can now um, monitor and manage. And with that, um, the we increased the security capabilities for Microsoft Teams to manage and secure access. We also gave you the ability for Azure monitoring to do like a more in-depth monitoring of what is happening in Azure AD. So with that, you're protecting your in-between, like your on-prem, but also your cloud, and everything that sits in between those two worlds, um, you can now monitor and um, report on. And on top of that, we um, increased the interoperability with uh, SAM and ARM. So ARM is not only taking all those events and uh, alerts, but it's getting more information into Security Event Manager based on a user. So you will not only see just log on failures and anything happening in your system from SAM, but now you get additional information on a certain user and um, like where they would have permissions. And also if they act against those permissions, SAM can now capture that as well. All this is done by syslog, so it's as easy as it can be. And with that, I'm going to take you over to the ARM demo for a second. As we look into ARM, uh, the rich client, we see the most uh, important features of ARM listed on the start page, starting with permission analysis, really the first step that everybody should be doing, like who has access to what, the user provisioning, and you can do that for multiple resources and technologies. Also, the security monitoring with all your alerts that you can now forward to SAM. 
And then um, the biggest part, or it seems like the biggest part, is the documentation and reporting. And this is exactly where I want to take you right now, because with all these latest features, what is great about it is that you can now report on um, Teams and Azure AD. And taking you into here, um, this is just one of the reports you can do. You can add your own titles. You can um, have more information added to this. And this is where you're going to like choose your resource. And you can do that, of course, for like file service exchange, SharePoint online, SharePoint. But now you can also do that for SAD and in addition for Teams. And this is where I'm going to take you right now. So we drill down into Teams. And this is just a demo setup. So in your environment, this is all going to look like different. You're going to see all your groups and your team members. But I'm going to go for all colleagues. And this is as easy as it gets. You just choose the uh, certain area you want to um, report on. You can then add more details, filters, group settings, or any other options. And there is a great feature hidden in this. You can not just only start this manually, but you can also set this up to be sent to you on a daily, weekly, monthly, or whenever you want kind of basis. So this is going to send or been sent to you as an email. And once we apply this, um, this is going to take a little second and we hit the start button. And I prepared a report for you to look at. And right now you see this is going to come to you in a PDF um, kind of format. So you see this is our ARM report, who has access where. And we are looking at all colleagues and we are also looking at uh, Teams and Azure AD. So now it's breaking down for us the all colleagues section in our Teams environment. And you're going to see all uh, users that are um, under all colleagues. Obviously, that's going to be all colleagues. But what's great about it is showing you if these are just a member or if they are a, an owner of a certain group. And this is important because right now with everybody working from home, not being in the office, we don't know who can like add people to a team or get people out of a team. And with this, we just gain more overview. And as always in ARM, you get a little explanation to everything. So even if you don't know what all this means, this is going to explain to you in the report in more detail. You can do way more things with ARM in particular. And um, you can forward everything and you can report on everything. You can have things sent to you as an email. But um, if you want to learn more about it, just let us know. But with this, I'm kicking back to Ashley for Security Event Manager. Thank you so much, Manya. Those are some really interesting features. And today I'm now going to be showing you guys uh, the new feature in Security Event Manager. We have a couple different um, highly requested user features, but what was really big for us was the analyzed historical data. So if you toggle over to the events tab, you see your events coming in real time as usual. But if you want to take a look a little bit more in depth, you can click over to that tab and you will then start seeing events in this histogram where uh, you can look at events during any specific period. So if you click here, you can look at events over the last 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 days, or of course be able to customize that date range to your specifics. By clicking search, let's look at events for the last 30 minutes. A user case that people are often interested in, of course, is seeing um, user logon failures. So what we have, uh, what's great with SEM, as you probably already know, is our amazing ability to have a bunch of predefined filters. So if you type in something like logons, you can look at user logons, simply add that, it goes right up into your query search bar. You just wanna hit search again. And now you're specifically looking at those events over a given period of time. What's great about this as well is that you can actually drag and drop um, to zero in even on a more specific time uh, base. And if you, of course, want to look at sort of the normalized log and a, an event or a specific user, you can click into that event and you will have all of your event details displayed on the right hand side of your screen. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Just remember, this is the 2020.2 release, so make sure you're upgraded to the latest version. It's available to you now. And also make sure you're going to leave some feedback on Slack for us on how you like it and uh, also what you're going to see in the future. And thank you so much for being with us and see you soon. See you next time.
Thanks again for being a part of today's episode. Um, we loved having you with us. And like we warned you at the beginning, this was a mega episode. I think this might have been one of the largest ones that we've ever done. But there were so many features that were released as a part of this latest Orion platform update that it took a while to get through them all. And we didn't even have time to do deep dive how-tos on all of them. So make sure you check out the link uh, that accompanies this video for details to a Thwack article that will actually link you to the individual features and walk you through them. Um, the other thing, of course, is hopefully you're already a part of the THWAC user community. There's 150,000 professionals who are part of the THWAC community, and they are they are doing and have been doing advanced things with the Orion platform for years. They are always eager to help you get started and to walk through some of the things that they're doing in their environments. Um, one other thing, of course, is that we're going to be online here for a little while taking your questions. And if you see the chat box, well, then pop your questions in, and we'd love to hear from you right now. Now, of course, if you don't see the live chat, it's because you're not with us live. And the way to fix that is to come by our homepage, and that's lab.solarwinds.com. You can see features, you can see past episodes, and most of all, you can see the schedule for upcoming events to make sure you can be with us live next time. Thank you again so much for being here, and we'll see you again soon.